welcome to another episode of the Ali Show, and today we have a special guest, Mr. Cameron Ralston, a professional MMA fighter. Um, what's your record now, Cam? Uh, as of last Saturday, it's now seven wins, two losses. Seven wins, so yeah. nine fights in total, seven and two. Wow, that's a pretty impressive record, bro. Mm. Um, yeah, so talking about your last fight last weekend, let's jump straight into the last fight. Um, Shuriken Fight Series, probably the, um, would you say that's the biggest event in New Zealand for MMA? Well, on Dan's podcast, he said like the North Islands, like the premier mm. North Island events, but yeah, I'd say so. Like, I know a few that are around the North Island as well, but a lot of them are like they they wouldn't Small they wouldn't have shows. the ability to yeah to rent out like a, a stadium, like a local oh, stadium, like um, Shuriken did. Shuriken one, um, the one that you uh, were fighting at, where was that uh, event? Uh, event Finder Stadium on event the North Finder. Shore. Oh, yeah. that's a that's a pretty fancy. Well, yeah. they had they had King in the Ring there the night mm. before, and King in the Ring goes there, so it's like they can fill it out, obviously. But there was a, from what I understood, there was a bit of a restriction on the yeah. number of mm. yes. How many people was in attendance? Um, they usually do like I want to say like two thousand. When I went to one, I think it was like two thousand. Wow. But this one was only five hundred, and they uh, they only did tables, and they split like the stadium up into five different sections so each section was technically counted as a building had its own qr code so when people like traced they had to go into the specific section do the uh, trace and track on the qr code and then they had like um what like 10 tables in each section so 10 tables of 10 100 people and they couldn't actually go into the other sections they were all barred off yeah just with like crowd control barriers but people weren't allowed to like walk up to the barriers and stuff. And I, I wasn't even allowed to go because I had a few people there who were supporting me from CKB and from my work as well. Like I wasn't even able to go out afterwards and say hi to them in the car park. Like when we left, the security guard was like, hey, you have to go into your, you have to go straight into your car and leave. Like you can't, we can't have people um, gathering oh. in the car park because the whole point is to keep people separated, right? Yeah. But if everyone just goes in and then comes out in the car park and there's 500 people high-fiving each other in the car park, yeah, kind of, kind of defeats the yeah, purpose. Yeah, defeats the whole purpose. So, yeah. but would you say that's pretty weird? Like, uh, had, was is is that your first fight during the uh, this whole after this post COVID period? That's yeah, that's the first one this year and the first one during the pandemic. So, yeah, uh, right. yeah, that's pretty weird. Like, um, you know, obviously when you, after after your fight, like if you win, you want to celebrate. You want to like, you know, go to high five your mates and uh, you know people want to hug you and uh, mm. you know although like you're sweating or you might be. You yeah, know, covered in blood yeah. and shit. Like people want to have that, you know. Mm. Um, it's pretty loud, eh? That background. <laughs> anyway, yep. Um, Auckland Transport sorted out. Yeah. Mike Ango, if you work for Auckland Transport, let's sort this out. <laughs> it's a Saturday. It's a Saturday at two twenty p.m. It's like it's again a law, man. Like so Saturday is like no, it's a no, man. Should be it's like no a go. certain amount of decibels they can't go over. <laughs> this is on you, Mike. <laughs> Oh man, he's uh, probably uh, enjoying himself uh, in quarantine right now. With he is, uh, he's loving it. Uh, him and Carlos are sharing a room together. They're having you know ice cream from Gyapo and like you doing, know doing ab workouts together and stuff, <laughs> shaving, shaving each other's backs, moisturizing up together, putting oiling up, bro. That's the... <laughs> oh man, I'm I'm having like images in my head now. <laughs> Carlos woke up like that. Mike has to put in the manscaping work. Mike has to like put some work in. Carlos is like, I just woke up like this. Yeah, it's all natural. <laughs> it's, but I think it might be good because uh, he gives he's gonna give Mike a lot of tips and uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how to achieve the certain look. You're welcome, Golly. <laughs> you got your own Carlos now, Golly. Oh man. Oh boy. But um, yeah, back to um the Shuriken event. So uh, besides the Shuriken fight uh, series, was it? Um, what other events are there in North Island? I know there's one that Core MMA runs called uh, Full Force Full Force Fight Night or something. Oh, okay. uh, they run that out of their gym. They got quite a big gym. Mm. Um, there's the. It's a decent space eh, in mm. that one. Uh, there's a few kind of like K1 shows as well in the ring where they have MMA fights as well. Not like a. Not like an exclusive MMA fight night, but it, they'll fill the card with a few MMA fights on that. Mm. Um, was it out of, out of war? No, that one's City Liga, right? Yeah, that's that's usually just kickboxing. Mm. Um, 
I couldn't tell you the the name of them yeah. off the top of my head. Um, um, so there's nine nine fights that you've had. Um, were they all in New Zealand or? So this was the first one I had in New Zealand. Really? Yeah. Wow. So I was um I was really excited about this one. So with the whole training camp and stuff and COVID, I was like, "Fuck, is this like actually going to happen? Like, am I going to fight in New Zealand?" Because I had a fight scheduled in. I think it was April or March. Yeah. So okay. Hey you, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this video. I was scheduled to fight in April or March here um, on Shuriken as well, but that whole card like fell through and didn't happen because of the pandemic. And then like we had it rescheduled again for September and then it got pushed back again. I'm like... In my head, I'm like, this isn't going to happen, but I like, keep training. So I was kind of disappointed each time we get getting, kept getting pushed back because I, you know, I've been here for at at this point about a year, almost two years, and at my work and stuff, I always get asked, when are you fighting in mm. next? Are you going to fight in Auckland? I want to come watch. And like people here from City Kickboxing, they ask like, when are you fighting? I want to come watch because I was here when I was here last year as well. I had three fights last year, but they were all over in Australia. And like the streaming wasn't the best over there. And so no one really got to watch Like The only people who got to watch live were people who came to the show. Um, there was a few boys from that I took over with me in the corner and they got to watch it and stuff. But um, yeah, it was just, it was just like a lot of anticipation, but like personally for myself, and mm. I just felt like a lot of anticipation as well from other people here who supported me. Like they really wanted to come and watch. So it was good to get that like first yeah. one done. In there's, there's like a bit of pressure as well on you you know, knowing that, you know, you have all these people who are waiting for it and mm. then like, you know, you have something that's up in the air. You don't know if it's, it's going to go down or not mm. or, you know, and where it's going to go. And it's like, it's, it's a weird feeling. Mm. You kind of like, um, you're expecting to fight, but at the same time, you're expecting for it to be cancelled or postponed as oh, well. 100%. 100%. Well. <laughs> and that must be hard as well because, you know, you got to prepare yourself like physically, mentally, yeah. And obviously, you know, you got a whole week cutting and everything and all that sort of stuff. Um, oh, back to, so you've been, you were saying um, you've been here for a year? Was that too close to two years? Two so, years in, at the start of January. So before this, where were you in Sydney? Yeah, I was born and bred in Sydney. Oh, nice. Yeah, I stayed in Sydney pretty much up until like I left here. Like I didn't yeah. live anywhere else. How, how did you come about um, picking up uh, MMA? Um, so I started, uh, at a gym called training grounds in Sydney. It's quite a small gym. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, it was just on the outskirts of the city of Sydney, um, in crow's nest. So a yep. lot of the people around there were just like, just had normal jobs and trained. Like we still had a lot of high level guys there, but they all had normal jobs and trained. Uh, and then I just, it just opened cause I lived down there and it just opened up and I didn't, I was 17 at the time when I joined, so I wasn't old enough to drink, to go out to like pubs and stuff and yeah. drink with my mates. And I was like, well, I got a part-time job. Like I've just finished school. I got a little bit of cash in my pocket. Like I've got all this time. What am I going to do? I'm going to go and train because I can't go to the pub and drink, even though I wasn't really into that. But you know, yeah. all your mates do it. You just feel kind of left out if you don't go. Yeah, that's like the pure pressure. Yeah. 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 Okay. And so... So I was just training there and the coaches there were real good to me. Scott and I were the first coaches there. Uh, Scott was the Muay Thai coach and the he was also a brown belt at the time. Oh. He's now a black belt. And then Ayo was the boxing coach. And they both kind of were very welcoming. They both um, put in a lot of time early on into me. I think they saw some potential or they just saw like a lot of commitment because pretty much straight off the bat, I was like training twice a day, Monday to Saturday. I would go into that gym and, and just spend like all my day there and just train. Because so, you were free anyway. You didn't have like yeah, a lot on yeah. your plate. So I was doing personal training at the time. Like uh, that was my first job out of high school. And hmm. I'd work in the mornings and I'd finish by about, I'd, I'd start at like five and I'd finish by 11 or 12. And then I could make it to a lunchtime class and a nighttime class. So I was training twice a day. Nice. And then uh, I, after like three or four weeks, I got into jiu-jitsu as well. And just from there, it was just... What's I the, did everything the, twice. The, the gym, um, do they have like a particular style that stand, you know, that they train more or was it got everything? It was everything. Boxing, kickboxing. Yeah, they had boxing, kickboxing slash Muay Thai and uh, Jiu Jitsu. No wrestling though. Mm. Um, they had an MMA class, um, which was on as well. Uh, but it was, it was very 
fundamental MMA stuff, like very basic, basic. war work. Um, but that's good for, yeah. for like at that point when you yeah. just started, yeah. that was perfect. Yeah, it was like, it was, yeah, it was perfect. Um, what else did they, they had judo as well. They had a judo class. I never did the judo though, because because <laughs> we all know judo doesn't work. <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> yeah, Kevin's going to get upset, man. Yeah. He's going to get upset. He's going to say, yeah, but... Okay, then now we've got into the argument. Since we since we're there, let's talk about it. BJJ and judo. Which one's better? Which one's better? Hmm. <laughs> oh, what? I okay. Honest, for, I I'm not like um, hundred percent sure. You know, on like the techniques and stuff like that. Okay, give us a breakdown, bro. Give us a breakdown on your um views on bjj and judo what the pros and cons are each and then tell us what, which one you think is better okay so i would definitely say for mma if we're just going purely off mma you're gonna have to do jujitsu okay i'm gonna say jujitsu because a lot of those throws that you get in judo you can you do in jujitsu as well uh, kevin's gonna kill me for this but <laughs> <laughs> he probably <It's>, is <laughs> but i mean once you a lot of the times like if you can get someone to the ground um in judo the the emphasis isn't as much on submitting your opponent on the ground whereas jiu-jitsu i feel like it's a lot more there's a lot more emphasis towards controlling your opponent on the ground submitting him advancing position like that uh, whereas if you take like pure sport judo and you kind of put it into MMA, it just doesn't quite translate as well because a lot of the emphasis is on standing up, especially uh, in in the judo. Like I know you have to wear a gi and stuff, and then it goes into no gi. But I just feel like it's um it's a lot harder for judo uh, for judo athletes who come into MMA to transfer that control that they've learned from judo mm. into control for MMA. Whereas jiu-jitsu, it's going to be a lot easier for um, guys who learn, say, no gi, jiu-jitsu, and transfer that straight into MMA. When you first started learning um, jiu-jitsu, uh, was it a gi or no gi? It was gi, yeah. Gi. So a lot of, uh, at my gym, I know this is the case with quite a few gyms as well, is they don't let people start no gi until about blue belt or high-level white belt. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard of that mm. one, but... I, I, I prefer it to be done that way, to be honest. Like, mm -hmm. I think it just teaches you. It brings more of, like, the martial art aspect into mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu for a lot of the guys. Like, there's a lot of line up in your rank, bow, shake hands with all the people who are high ranked above you, learn how to, like, learn how to take care of your gi. Like, it's a lot of maintenance to take care of a gi. Like, it's one wear, one wash, and you got to dry it out and stuff. Like, you pay $200 for a gi, you want to take care of it. Whoa, like if really? you, you know, if you pay two hundred dollars for a pair of jeans, you want yeah. to take care of it as well. Yeah, so that's it's kind of the same right? as well. Oh well, you see people spending thousands of dollars on a pair of jeans. Yeah, yeah. or a pair of shoes, mm. which yeah, is so, going to get dirty. Mm. <laughs> and it's um, the gear as well. I feel like it teaches uh, it teaches all like the fundament mm. fundamental movements of jujitsu uh, that that you need before you can move on to no gear. Like there's a you can skip over a lot of things in no gi if you're an athletic person you can get away with a lot of stuff but if you put the gi on and say like you want to whip your arm out or something it's going to be a lot harder because the friction is so much more plus there's the chance of say like your opponent grabbing your gi as well you yeah can't. I think that was one of the arguments that I've heard like a lot of people talk about is when you have that gi you know you have that pulling and you know just that grabbing but whereas if you bring it to MMA there's nothing to pull yeah and yeah. um you know. Yeah, that, that's a bit hard. I mean, it's, it's always good, I feel, it's always good for you to learn the basics of any particular martial art. And then um, from there, you kind of develop your skill and you learn other stuff and you, you know, improvise and stuff like that. But like, um, it's, it's, it's hard. Like if you have someone who, who just wants to compete in MMA and they have to go through that whole process, mm. you know, um, it's, it, it, and it's, it doesn't take a while. It, okay, on average, for someone who even is going fast, training a lot and stuff like that and you are pretty much uh how long does it take to you to get to like the was it what did you say blue belt blue belt yeah. yeah how long does it take roughly um it can take for someone who does say jiu-jitsu every day monday to friday and they're yeah. very good and yeah, athletic that's and, they, on. <laughs> and they pick everything up i'd say like if i was their coach i would uh at minimum a year and a half 
Wow. Yeah. That's yeah, a while. Minimum, a year and a half. And then for someone that that is for someone who's going full on. Yeah. You know? So like especially if they're a white belt who or someone not just a white belt, but someone who has like the intentions of competing mm. quite high and wants to win competitions, you want to hold them back for as long as possible because you don't want them to just like smash all these white belts because they get mm. barn athleticism. Like I've seen this happen and then they grade to blue belt in like nine months or something and then they go to the blue belt division and now you're versing guys who are almost at purple belt like Ooh. there's a huge difference between someone who's just got their blue belt and someone who's ready to get their purple belt like in some cases if you get your purple belt it's saying like you're almost ready for your brown belt as well how many uh, before i get um lost um how many belts are there again so there's this white blue purple, purple brown brown black. and then black okay yeah yeah and then, um, so there's a huge, huge like skill differential between someone who's just got their blue belt and someone who is about to get their purple belt, someone who's at the end of their blue belt. And so if you grade someone from white belt to blue belt too early and they just smashed everyone in competitions because they're athletic and fast and whatnot, maybe they got like one or two submissions that they've mastered or mastered, but like got really good at. Mm. And then they come up against someone who's like gonna be a purple belt, they just get absolutely destroyed. And especially if you've only been doing jiu-jitsu for like maybe that nine, 10 months or whatever, you've got this huge ego as well. And you like, you haven't been crushed enough yet. And so you get crushed by these guys who are almost purple belts. And you're like, oh, what the hell? Like, I, I just got my blue belt. This isn't right. Like, what's going on here? <laughs> and then it's just, it's, there's a lot more to it than just like, just winning. Like you've got to, you've got to pay your dues kind of and understand that. <laughs> When you get to like the next level, there's still a level above you, who's gonna who you're gonna compete against. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, it's, it's hard. difficult. So okay, back to starting um, at um, the gym, and um, so you've started with like the boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, and then went on to Jiu Jitsu. At that time when you you were doing that, did you have any idea that you're gonna compete in MMA, or did you have a plan, or was it just just like just uh, training? It was, I knew I wanted to kind of compete in jiu-jitsu because at the time I, when I was doing jiu-jitsu, we had quite a few boys who were competing as well. I'm like, I want to be part of this as well. Like, I want to go to the comps with them. I want to like, I want to cheer them on. I want them to cheer me on. I want to kind of like stand on the podium, get a medal. This would be cool. Like, I want to see what it's all about. And so I knew I wanted to kind of like compete in something, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to get punched in the face yet. <laughs> that was the thing because I was still sparring at the time. And uh, well, I just started sparring, and um, like I still had the bad habits of kind of like turning my head away. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's always a bad habit yeah. when, you, when you're just starting. I still like could barely make it through a two minute <laughs> round of boxing. <laughs> I'll make it through a two minute round and just go and sit like on the stairs and just be like trying to catch my breath. Back. Yeah, <laughs> like I, I hadn't learned how to how to breathe when you're getting mm. punched yet, and it was all that stuff. So. I knew that I wanted to at least try competing in jiu-jitsu, but I wasn't, I didn't know that I wanted to do MMA yet. I mean, I watched it. I'm like, this is cool. Like, but I was like, oh, this looks like it could hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty much you, um, you know, went off like with the, the jiu-jitsu stuff and all that. And then before you started to get, when was the, uh, in what, what, when was your first fight? Uh, my first fight was, uh, K1 fight mm. and I had that in I think it was early April or late March of 2014 so just just after about a year of training mm -hmm. and um, back then it was kind of like the wild west in combat sports like you could rock up on the day and they say shin pads you're wearing shin pads or they'd be like no shin pads or they'd say what? okay we're gonna do elbows yeah like you get in the middle of the ring and the referee would be like okay uh, actually put the headgears on or, or your no. opponent would be like, I want to wear shin pads. So you have to wear shin pads. That's but, really um, strange. For a pro, uh, that was a, was that this was just fight? amateur. Oh, yeah, okay. this yeah, is yeah. amateur. So it was kind of like a bit touch and go on the night. Mm. But um, yeah, it was good fun. And then... And that was I in think, Sydney as well? That was in Sydney. And then I think four, four or five weeks later, I had an MMA fight. I had an MMA fight. And that was my first MMA fight. That was um, That was just like full normal MMA rules. Like elbows knees to the head everything stuff, but it was three minute rounds Ooh, okay so again it was the wild west and, yeah well not the wild west but like it was a bit touch and go with the rules mm. and then just there was no clear rounds. set of rules like really at that time or for there so for that fight show i specifically remember when we weighed in 
um, the commission that we had there uh, gave us gave all the fighters the rules meeting, and they're like, yeah, amateurs, no elbows to the head, like only knees to the body, no no knees to the head. And then the next night, the referee was like, oh, okay, sweet guys, uh, yeah, elbows to the head for everyone, knees to the head. Uh, any questions? And I'm like. I'm like, I'm not going to ask. Yeah. I'm not going to say what happened last night because I don't look like a pussy in front of everyone. <laughs> I just I just try not to get kneed in the head if it's going to happen or oh, like elbowed shit, but, in the head. But uh, you're a pretty tall guy, so yeah. I think it might be a little bit harder to mm. get kneed in the head, mm. you know, compared to someone shorter. But but, but that's pretty weird. Like, um, why would he, Why would you say that? That's just, I think that's just screwing with your head. Like, that's just poor communication. Yeah, yeah. It's, on the night before, you just say all this stuff and then you come the next day and everything just out the window. It yeah. didn't really matter at that point. I was kind of like, oh, fuck, I've done all this training. Like, I'm this <laughs> far anyway. What are you going to do? Say no and just pull out <laughs> of cut the weight and stuff. There's yeah. no point. Just, yeah. Go for it. You're, you're, you're too far in to turn back now. Yeah. So basically, um, oh, I wanted to ask... Uh, so in in Sydney, the the community there is it a big um, MMA or community over there? Huge, yeah, huge. Mm. In Sydney, I definitely feel like it's massive. Like um, from when I started, uh, that was kind of like yeah. So when I started, I remember that Rob Whitaker had just won the Ultimate Fight of the year before at the end of the year, and so we're like, oh, well, we got this. This Aussie guy, <laughs> this, this Aussie guy, yeah. who's um who's doing because we had a few Australians in the UFC at the at that time, but mm. they weren't they weren't like gathering as much uh, steam and hype as um as Rob Whitaker was, mm. and so it grew and grew, and because he was from Sydney as well, like the whole the whole um the, like the sport was getting traction in the papers. It was on like Fox Sports News. It was like you flip over into the sports section, it'd be in the front of the sports section and stuff. So that was really good. And then more gyms started popping up after that. I think people started to realize that jiu-jitsu is a good martial art to have where you don't have to get punched in the face and it works as well. And it has all like the, teaches all the traditional stuff. And so more jiu-jitsu gyms were popping up um, all over Sydney. Um, like the kids started doing it. Those I noticed that a lot more kids started doing it and with kids doing it, like it be, starts to become like a normal thing. It's not like, oh, your kid does jiu-jitsu, like he must be a thug. No, it's not, it wasn't really like that or anything. Yeah, and then now when I go back, uh, I just see like so many more from like the area where I live in, there was my gym and that was it. And now there's got to be four or five more gyms there. Wow. Whether they're just a boxing gym, mm -hmm. a Muay Thai gym, a kickboxing gym or just like an MMA or jiu-jitsu gym or something. There's a lot of gyms that um, started off as like boxing gyms and now that they kind of grew from there, they added in their Muay Thai, they've added in jiu-jitsu classes and all that. So it's grown so much more in the last like eight years. With, um, with jiu-jitsu as well, from what I understand, like there's different schools could you tell us a little bit more about it? Because I don't want to. I don't want to give some wrong information. Right? Yeah, so <laughs> it's it can be quite political with all the schools and stuff. Yeah. Um, hey, you! Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this video. So in Sydney, there's um, there's quite a few schools. There's um, there's like the Gracie Baja. There's the Gracie Humate. There's um, there's the uh, oh, what's it called? There's your Will Machados. There's all your, all your like original jiu-jitsu schools, and they were kind of the first That's ones. Something. They were kind of the first ones who, who started jiu-jitsu in Sydney. So they were they popped up around like 06, 07, 08, maybe even older. I don't want to misquote, but yeah. they've been around for a long time. And a lot of those schools built up guys to black belt, and those black belts then started up their schools as well. And so they started a lot of affiliate gyms, but it gets like, it gets kind of a little bit hazy because this guy doesn't like that guy. You can't train at that gym. This guy yeah, doesn't like yeah. that guy. You can't train that gym. Oh, he put that guy in a, in a heel hook in a competition. Like this is 10 years ago where mm -hmm. like, if you heel hook someone, you're like, you basically spat on their mother. <laughs> and so it's like, <laughs> oh, he, he heel hooked him. Like you, you can't train there. Oh, and then I feel like over the years, you know, a lot of those guys who, came up in those affiliates and who got who were who were built up from white to black 
white white belts to black belts and open up their own gyms. They're like, this is like, this is stupid. This isn't my beef. Like, why should I have beef with them? I'm going to just start my own uh, jujitsu school. And that's what I see. I, that's what I saw happen with uh, a few people. And then they started their own jujitsu schools where it's like, everyone's welcome. I don't care who you, who you're affiliated with. I don't care who who like if you like that guy or you don't like that guy like everyone can come train here i don't mind at all and then uh there's more of those schools now i feel like than there are of the ones that don't like each other so all the jiu-jitsu schools that that's kind of dying off it's dying off with uh like the the prejudice of jiu-jitsu schools are dying off as the as the new schools open up and the new kind of generation of black belts and gym owners are coming through Mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. A, it's like a different culture altogether mm-hmm. and um like you hear a lot like the um oh the, one of the, the the cool the cool ones that i heard was the 10 planet 10 planet yeah, yeah. and like I, well I, at that point when someone first told me about it and i said like, i've never heard of it before i was like what's that you 10th planet black belt i was like what do you mean <laughs> bro you mean like you've got to be like first planet second planet is that how it works man that's a lot of black belts bro i was like that's, that's a lot of grading, first planet. Bro. I was like, what? first planet <laughs> i was like yo are you serious and i didn't i didn't know that and then nobody explained it to me until um i did my own research and i found out oh 10 planet is actually the name of the yeah, uh, yeah. the place i was i was confused man i was like yo that's too, too many names for it um but yeah, and then the, you know, talking about the um, the no gi, gi and no gi stuff. Um, would you say there's a um, for people who've done gi a long time, you know, having jumping into no gi, would you say it's a bit of a struggle or it just comes naturally? It's different with everyone. Um, I definitely feel like guys who have been doing gi for so long and go into no gi. This personally. Uh, what I've experienced is that they do struggle with the no gi. Um, say like someone who's, say you do gi Monday to Thursday, and then you do a no gi class on a Friday, and you've been doing that for years and years. Like they're all they're always going to be lacking in their no gi. And like a few guys I know as well have gone pure gi, and then they've like, oh, I'll give this no gi thing a try. And then there's like these little these kids who have kids like 16 17 who've only done no gi growing up and they're just like absolutely mopping the floor with these like 35 year old brown belt g uh gi guys yeah Ooh, yeah <laughs> and then they get quite frustrating and it's funny to watch watching an, ad- <laughs> watching an adult struggle with a teenager <laughs> i mean uh mentally it kind of screws with you a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah but it is if yeah it is a hard thing to transition to but i think the the longer you've been doing gi and then you transition to no gi, if you stick with it, the time to adjust will be a lot shorter than it is for someone who's like a blue or a white belt and then they go to no gi mm. and try it. Um, so the, all the, so basically eight fights you had in uh, Sydney. Well, not, not all of them were in Sydney. Oh. I had a few, uh, I had one in Canberra. Yeah, I had uh, one in Townsville as well. So oh, the, nice. yeah, they weren't all in Sydney. Oh, Townsville was um, that's the place where the recent fight was between the boxing fight. Yeah, uh, Horn Tim, and uh, Tim Zoo. Yeah, Tim Zoo and Horn, that was a good yeah. fight, bro. Yeah, I enjoyed. Did you watch that one? I didn't watch. I watched the highlights. Oh, bro, that was a good fight, man. Yeah, Jeff Horn is yeah. Yeah, Jeff Horn. <laughs> I uh, the Hornet. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> I mean. Um, I I I, did, I haven't watched a lot of uh, Team Zoo's fight before that. I just uh, you know you see a few highlights here and there, but um you know obviously we knew who Costa Zoo was mm. and you know how good he was and uh, so like uh, and also you know before that fight went on in Townsville, um, uh, me I think me and uh, Junior we were talking about uh because we we were we were training with someone who who had some experience with uh, Costa Zoo back then when he was competing. Mm. And he shared a little bit about that. And um, yeah, I don't know if people realize like him and his dad actually look fucking alike, you know. It's so it's so similar. And um, so yeah, going into that fight, you know, I personally don't really, I, I don't really like uh, Jeff Horn's style. Like I feel it, it just puts him in very dangerous positions. How... <laughs> 
you know, um, his his roughhousing style. It's, it's that's, a bit hot. That's uh, that's typical Australian boxing. <laughs> Very much similar, not as refined as the Mexican boxing, mm. but um, if you watch a lot of the um, Australian amateurs in the Olympics and the Commonwealth Games, they like to get hit. I don't know if they like getting hit, but they get hit a lot. Yeah, yeah that's so that's, strange. I don't yeah. know why you would adopt the, uh, I mean... You know, you have people who say you, you take a few to give, mm. but like, you, is it worth taking five to get land one? Mm. Well, if that one knocks someone out, then okay, but you know, what the odds? It's yeah. hard if you want to go with that style all the way. But yeah, and watching that fight, man, Tim was awesome. Like, his, you look, watch his style and you watch his composure as well, just so calm. And bro, that was awesome, and that was a really good fight. Um, but yeah, I heard the latest one was um, he's probably going to fight um, a Kiwi guy. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I saw I saw someone post about that. I think Cairo. Day. Cairo George uh, posted. Uh, he, I think, what's his name? Uh, oh, is he from Christchurch? Yeah, yeah. I think he's from Christchurch. Um, the, uh, mid, mid, I think, is it Middleweight? Middleweight. Mm. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I might be wrong, but yeah, I think he's supposed to. That might be the next fight. But um, yeah, you could see that you know, Tim Zhu definitely was, uh, uh, you know, off. He was a skilled fighter. You know, you could see that him and his dad, you know, there's a lot of similarities there. It was pretty awesome. Um, yeah, so competing in, uh, you know, different parts of Australia. And um, so when when did you kind of make the decision to come here to City Kickboxing? Uh, so it was 2018. Uh, it must have been like, I want to say November, November, October. I had fought in 2018 in September and I had lost quite badly and I was kind of like I'm in an iron about the sport and um, so I decided well I didn't decide I I came here just for like a week for a holiday um, with my family we were just checking it out I'm like oh, okay cool I'm I'm gonna check out city kickboxing because you know everyone knows the yeah. boys in the UFC and like it's I was starting to pick up some good steam and I'd known about this gym for a long time, since about 2015. Um, I had a few mates who fought on King in the Ring against Israel as well. And um, I was actually, I had to be, I had to be Israel for them. Me and my coach, were, my other coach, Scott, is, were both quite tall. And mm. So that was like kind of the first time I'd heard about City Kickboxing in 2015. Anyways, so I'm here for a holiday and I'm like, okay, I'm going to check. I'm going to finally check this gym out. I've been meaning to do it for many years. I'm going to finally check it out. And... I came in, um, I think, for a sparring on a Saturday. Ooh. And I'm like, oh, I wonder how sparring is going to go. Because my experience with sparring is you message two or three mates the night before and you see who can come. You might get, you'll get one, you might get two. It's a great day if you got three. <laughs> if you got three people there, it's a great day of sparring. Yeah. And so um, I'm like, oh, okay, maybe I'll just, maybe there'll be like 10 of us or something. I get there and it's like 80 people. <laughs> and I'm like, holy crap. This is, and I'm like, I'm looking around There's the gym. Wild, I'm, I'm looking around wild. the gym. I see like Dan Hooker. I see, who else did I see? I see like Kai. I see all these. I see the Varke brothers because I've known about them as well for a while through the, like the local scene. I'm like, okay, there's a lot of guys here. And there's like even... Even some of the people I didn't know that I did rounds with, I'm like, man, these guys have kicked my ass. I got no idea who they are. Yeah. And so it was kind of like at the end of that, my mom was like, how was it? I'm like, mom, you'll never believe how many people are there. Like, I can't believe how many people <laughs> they can fit on the mat there. And then, and she was like, oh, that's great. You should like go back again and train. I'm like, hell yeah. I'm going to like ditch the family holiday just to train. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. But anyways, um, we... Yeah, so we just did our normal stuff and then I did I did a few more classes during the week, like the wrestling, the VO2 wrestling as well. I was like, man, these guys get after it. Like, this is what I need. I don't just, because in Sydney, it was kind of like, like I said before, you got to message ahead and see who's going to turn up to training because you don't know if you're going to get there, if you're going to have enough people for a hard session. And There wasn't like a full on structure over there. No, nah, it was very, we tried, we, as much as we say there was a structure, there really yeah. wasn't a structure. <laughs> like you, you had, you knew what you had to do on days. Like, okay, tonight's the no gi class. We're going to do no gi. Mm -hmm. Tonight's the wrestling class. We're going to do wrestling. Tonight's the, the, you didn't have any structured classes or any times where you're like, we're going to like, we're going to do a spider. We're going to do a VO2. We're just going to like, what's that? Someone screaming. Again? <laughs> That's... Sounds like Kevin, I think. There's some pretty weird noises, eh? What 
Uh, is that a thick loop? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> what the hell? What the heck is that? Training at my yeah. old gym in Sydney uh, for fights would be like, like I get sent through my strength and conditioning program, which would be like top of the range, perfect. It was like, it was awesome. It, it got me really in shape, but it was just kind of missing that that high intensity uh Combat push, training. Yeah, combat training. Mm. Like I would, I could go hard in sparring and that would, that would be like a really hard session. Sparring, wrestling would be pretty hard as well. For, for back then, like for where I was, it'd be quite hard. But everything else wasn't, just wasn't hard enough. Yeah, so I just, that was the aspect that was missing. And I was like, well, you can do strength and conditioning anywhere, really. You just need a gym. So I can always keep that. You just need like an air bike and kettlebells and whatnot. And so mm. when I got, when I, when I did that week of training here, that first week of training, I was like, wow, this is what they do in a week. Like, this is a lot of volume. I'm like, I can do this. We can, I can come over here and do this. Like, this would be good. And, um, the way uh, Australia and New Zealand have structured their immigration between both countries, it's you don't need a visa. Like when you land in, say like for me, coming from Australia to New Zealand, when I land, I'm automatically granted a um, an Australian Australian residency visa. And um, I basically, it's basically like a citizenship in New Zealand, mm -hmm. but you, don't, you just don't have it. Like I get access to everything that a New Zealand citizen would have. So I was like, well, it'd be real easy to move over here then. And so then, like, uh, towards the end of the year, uh, I was thinking about it more and more. And then um, I managed to get a contact here. Uh, the guy who I work for now, David, um, he, I got that contact through my brother, who, who owns some gyms as well in Sydney. And um, so David was kind enough to give me a job. And he said, how would you like to start next Monday? Which was like five days away. I'm like, let's do it. And so it was the start of January. So I, uh, I booked the flight. I um, booked the Airbnb for a week just yep. to just to set just myself to settle up. In. Yep. And uh, packed my bag, broke up with my girlfriend, and then moved. Yeah. Wait, wait. You're, you're leaving up. <laughs> wait, wait. Did you just say you packed your bags and broke up with your girlfriend and then left? Yep. Oh shit, yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> well, was that necessary? Or? It was. It was super necessary. It had to happen. It had to happen. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Married to the sport. Married to the sport. Of oh MMA. man! Yeah. Wow, that's pretty brutal, bro. <laughs> was she? Um, was she, she must have been shocked, shocked, upset. So many emotions running at the same time, bro. Yeah, it was not to get not to get into it too much, <laughs> yeah. but it was like it. It was you kind it, of yeah. Knew it, was it was that going. tipping. It was at its tipping mm -hmm. point, and that was kind of like the catalyst yeah. to to like break it off yeah, yeah i mean i you you would know as well like uh, moving forward like being away for a long period and you know you're going to make this new commitment that you're mm. not going to have time for the other commitment so mm. it's better to just put a stop to it there and then instead of like dragging your problems with you yeah and, like, exactly bringing your problems on so that might you know obviously it's it's been a, a you know the best yeah solution for you at that time mm. um so yeah make the move and uh, oh so what were you doing for work um, back in Sydney before you left? So I was coaching at my MMA gym as well. Oh, yeah. So I was doing a lot of coaching there. I was doing a lot of PTs, doing a lot of pad work. Mm -hmm. And the where the gym was, like I said, it was on the outskirts of the city. So it was quite close to the CBD. So we had a lot of um, a lot of like uh, business uh, men and women coming in. And it was it was good money. Like I could make a lot of money holding holding pads like i'm a professional fighter like people like to say oh, i train with i train with a professional MMA yeah. fighter and whatnot so <laughs> i was yeah it was it wasn't hard to leave but i mean like i left a quite a well-paying job for only working four or five hours a day monday to friday and moving over here but it was kind of like well just go all in like you're young just delve straight into it this is it just no plan b just a plan a at that time 20, um, 2018 yeah, yeah. How old were you, twenty eighteen? So I was twenty three, in twenty eighteen. Wow. Yeah. So when I moved over here, it was the week before my twenty uh, fourth birthday. Oh, nice. So I moved over. I didn't know anyone here except my boss, and then I was just like, it was my birthday, and I'm just like, woke up, I'm like, hmm. So this is this is what it's like if you're lonely. 
<laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> living on your, um, yeah. I mean, living, that was the first, I mean, obviously that was the first time living away from your family as well. Yeah. Yeah. And just making that big move. That was, that's pretty impressive. Bro. Mm. Like um, not a lot of people in their early 20s would have done that, you know. You have mm. just like a, a select few who kind of venture out, you mm. know, move to another country, you know, or halfway around the world or whatever. But, you know, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of balls. Mm. For people who've never experienced it before and they think that it's easy, it takes a lot of balls, you know, being away from your comfort zone, your family, your friends, no support system, nothing, mm. you know, that's mm. wild, bro. It was, yeah, I'm fortunate that New Zealand and Australia are just neighbours. They're, they're good yeah. neighbours to each other. Everyone speaks English, like the culture is very this, very much the same here, like drive on the left-hand side of the road. It was, the transition was, was Smooth. easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so when you came to uh, Auckland, you were doing PT as well on the side. Yep. Other than training. Yep. So I'm just uh, down the road at a gym called Quattro Fitness. Quattro in Fitness. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we we were originally in Ponsonby, and we moved down. We moved into Kingsland last year, and yeah, it's been going really well since then. Like my boss is real easy. Like he lets me train, lets me fight, and all this stuff. Like he makes it really easy on me. So. Awesome. It's, that's that's yeah. pretty sweet deal. Yeah, it's, it, it, yeah, it's a good deal. Yeah, it's it's not it's um that's the other thing as a uh one of the thing one of the biggest challenges I think is like as a someone who's pursuing fighting, having a a job, you know, you obviously you've got to have a job to support you when you first start because you're you're not making enough money from your fights, you know, to mm. to support yourself. So having a like a a good setup that allows you to train and work, you know, and have your your work um work around your you know your schedule instead of you just having to work, you know, that rigid hours that they have. So that's like that's a pretty good deal. Yeah. Um so pretty much uh you were kind of you jumped into the same sort of work here while training. And so it's been like what two Two years or so you've been training here so how's your whole experience been like training at city kickboxing it's been so much better than what i thought it was going to be um i really did i was i wasn't too sure if i'd be here for two years like i i gave it a year and then after like after like six months i was barely scratched the surface of the system that they have here and i'm like this is going to take my whole life to learn i don't think i'll ever master this system here and so like when I kind of got to that point where I'm like, this is going to take forever to learn. It just kind of changed my whole outlook on how, how training is here and how, how it works around here. Like, yeah, it's not like you just can't come over and do a 12 week training camp to get ready for a fight or eight week training camp here. You have to, I learned very early on that from some of the boys that they told me like, you just need to be in the gym here every day to learn. Like it's, it's it got to the point where it was because like in Sydney you would just kind of like do your training camp and then just chill for a bit maybe take a few weeks off go to the beach or whatever high five your mates if you want yeah <laughs> but then it's like you you only I saw this with a lot of people you only get back into the gym if like you've got a fight coming up or like mm. you don't take training as seriously you might train maybe three times a week but here it's like you finish training and you get ready for the next training. You finish your fight, you take like one or two days off if you're not too banged up and you get ready to get back into the gym on Monday. So it's a it, lifestyle. It is. That's what it is. It's a lifestyle. Like it, it exceeded all my expectations, the, the gym here. Like I expected, I expected um, like a lot of people to kind of have that same mentality that people had back home. Like they finish fighting, we won't see them for like one or two weeks, maybe even three or four weeks. Like, People here would fight. They finish. They're on the mat the next the next week. They're helping other people get ready for their fight. So I'm like, well, if these guys are doing it and you want to be part of the team, you have to do what the rest of the team is doing. And so you got to give them the same amount of effort mm, and contribute. And on top of that, um, that kind of lifestyle of the of the gym and like seeing all these people every day, it's these people become your friends as well. Like you become their friends and they become your friends because they're the only people that you see during the day other than like people you might see at work or maybe like your barista up the road you get your coffee from. Like these are the people you spend all your time with during the day. Mm -hmm. And so because I was able to 
uh, assimilate into the team and just adopt the same mentality as them, they were like, okay, this guy's for real. Like he's not here just to do an eight-week camp and piss off. Like he's here to learn the system. He's here to train. And then they were all like, okay, cool. Now you're part of the team. Now we can now we can be friends with you hey you don't forget to subscribe like and share this video as i was saying it's not a gym where you can where you can do a camp and then leave like a lot of the gyms in america we're not going to name names but there are yep. a lot of gyms i've seen a lot of australians go over there do a camp take a photo with the coach and all the su superstars and champions there and then go into their fight and just like revert straight back to the to what they used to do like they didn't actually learn the system there. They just got some rounds in, got a little bit of fitness, lost their weight, and then went off and fought. Whereas here, you know, you learn the system, you become part of the team. And then when you become part of the team, like, because I was saying before, like you see these people every single day, mm. hours at a time. Um, you like you even stay in the gym with them or you go overseas with them for their fights and you sleep in the same hotel room as them. And so then they become your friends, you become their friend. I think you get to one of the, you know, I I spent some time, um, I was working in the oil and gas industry, so I was traveling a lot. And um, you actually, you get to know a lot about a person when like you're traveling around the world with them, mm -hmm. you know, and you're working overseas with them and stuff like that. It's different. You know, you, as I hate to admit it, but like as much as you know someone in your home t country, your hometown or whatever, you always find out something a little bit different when you travel with them. Mm. You know, yeah. and it might be good, might not be, but you'll find out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's definitely true. Yeah, yeah, There's... it's a bit of a waste, like you're saying. You know, if if they if they're gone all the way there to do a, you know to train and to learn, and then to come back and not you know and just jump back into the all we. Mm. Yeah, that's, I have, like last year, we I did see that with a few people who came over here. Like we, even at the start of this year before travel restrictions, I did see a lot of people who came in here and did like one or two weeks, maybe three or four weeks. And, you know, they're, they're not, they're good people, nothing against them. Like you want to be nice to them. You give them, you tell them everything. You try to like show them some stuff. They show you some stuff. But in the back of your head, you're like, well, I know what's going to happen in your fight. Like, you're not going to do anything that you've actually learned here. Like, when the adrenaline's flying, you've been punched in the face, you know, your nose is broke, whatever, you just revert straight back to what you've done. Sure, you got a little bit fitter. Like, you could definitely get fitter by yourself mm. uh, back home and save some money. But you, you got a little bit fitter, you lost some weight, you got some cool photos with the superstars here, but you didn't actually learn anything. Yeah. So Yeah, the main purpose should be the learning yeah, instead exactly. of the... You know, just the status of, mm. you know, coming to train at City Kickboxing. Yeah. I think it uh, it might have been like, uh, I mean, obviously, well, it's a it's it's a good thing. Like, um, you know, if people want to come here to train, you know, uh, it's a good thing for the gym and the business. But like, uh, for you know, as an individual, like, it's hard. Yeah. You know, to have to, um, you know, you. Yeah, it's weird. Like I, I don't know. Maybe and uh, maybe that would be like a funny thing as well. But like you know, you learn. Maybe you learn some stuff here, and then you your main purpose is to like to bring it back to your gym and to share like some tips and tricks. You know, like I mean, you can't hide everything. People mm -hmm. still gonna you know you do. That's why you do film study stuff like that. I mean, you can learn from people's fights and all that. But like, yeah, it's just sometimes I don't I don't really fancy like when when people do that. You know, they just go to the gym. They pick out all your stuff and then they bring it back. Mm. They just, just regurgitate it. Yeah. They get there and they just regurgitate it. And then people ask them, why, why why, would I do it like that? And then they can't really answer it because they just regurgitate it. They don't understand it. They mm. don't, they haven't like learned the different combinations of techniques. Like if this doesn't work, you flow into this one. And if this doesn't work, you revert back to this. They're just like, oh, no, nah, we just got shown it like this. So we'll just do it like just this. Just do it. Yeah. Yeah, just don't, do it. Don't understand the. Um, just do it because. Yeah, <laughs> that that I think that that was one of the, not just like um, you know across a lot of uh, you know the different you know boxing, kickboxing, all that. You know, I have some guys who, who where when I learned from some of the other gyms, um, they just did it that way and like, can you punch like this and like this and like that and but I'm like okay but why you know like mm. why can't you do it like this why can't you do it like that and 
I think that's that's where one of the things that um, Doug was saying that was really interesting is when you're looking for a coach, you got to understand, are you looking for a coach? Or are you looking for a pad man? Mm. You know, um, I mean, I'm not saying it's easy to hold pads. It's not easy and there's an art to it as well. There's, you know, certain experience that you need to have to do it. But like the main one, you really need to know why you do certain things, when to do it and like, you know, how to react to it and stuff like that. And this is what's lacking in some of the other gyms who don't have experienced coaches, I feel. You know, they just teach you like, okay, you got to do this, this, this. And I don't like how, um, oh, okay, maybe I don't say I don't like, but what I like about, um, you know, city kickboxing, I don't know if you, they don't really force you to go a certain way. And uh, they kind of look at how you are as a person, as a fighter, and then they work around what your skill set is, you mm. know, and improve it. And, you know, obviously you don't cut out like the bad stuff and like uh, work on your particular style. And like, whereas um, this was the thing that Eugene was saying, um, some gyms, they're so narrow-minded, like, you know, we don't want to do it different ways. It's how you do, this, this is how we say you do it, it's how you're going to do it. Mm. What, 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 what is your opinion on that? I definitely feel like um, you should develop your own unique style mm. suited to your body type. Like, um, if I can bring this back to comparing it to jiu-jitsu, you would you could see like some jujitsu gyms, um, their coach was learned like say the crush style or like a pressure style where you're just on top, just smash, smash, smash. And a lot of the times that coach is like five foot eight, hundred kilos, probably yeah. on steroids. <laughs> and then he's trying to he's trying to coach this style to Becky, who's twenty three and works in accounting and is like five foot two like 50 kilos or something yeah <laughs> I'm like she ain't gonna be crushing nobody she yeah. needs to work with her body type mm. so that might be that might be a closed guard game you need you might need to develop a really good bottom game because you don't have the weight to hold someone down or you just can't your the, like your limb length doesn't quite fit like the leverages and stuff to be on top and so i think um and also it comes down to what you like as well some people prefer to do a close guard game. Some people prefer to do like a leg lock game. Some people prefer just to absolutely crush their opponents and suffocate them. So I definitely think it comes down to what the person is more, that like their body type is more suited to and what they like more. Because if they like it, they're going to do it more and they're going to get better and better and better at it. So it definitely, if you put someone in a box like there, and they can, have, there's only like so, so so much more skill that you can develop in that box. Like there's a ceiling to it. Whereas mm -hmm. if you give them the opportunity to go out and explore different techniques and like develop their own style, it's going to be so much more better for them. Um, talking about like coaching and all that and different styles, we talk about the coaches here at City Kickboxing Row. Um, so when you first came, um, who were some of the first few coaches that you trained with over here? Uh, the first, the first coach that, uh, I trained with was Doug. I did Doug's 9 a.m. striking class. Ooh. And it was like, <laughs> I, uh, I'm i going to be honest, like I didn't know anything about Doug at this point. I knew that he was, um, I knew that he was a K1 champion, but I didn't know like all his idiosyncrasies and his personality and all that stuff. Yeah. So I was kind of, bit, <laughs> kind of a bit taken back. Like I'd come from a gym where it's like, yeah, everyone's very polite to each other. Like if you say something wrong or if you do something the coach didn't like, they'll be like, come on now. Whereas like, <laughs> that's, if you know Doug, that's yeah. not Doug at all. Yeah. <laughs> if you do something Doug doesn't like, you're going to know about it. Yeah. And it's hilarious. You'll, you'll know about it fast. And so I, um, yeah. And so I kind of saw that straight away and I enjoyed that first class. I was like, wow, he showed me a lot of good stuff. He also gave me a lot of shit as well. Told me that I knew nothing, which was true. <laughs> yeah. Cause, I mean, got, cause the stuff he showed, I was like, I was like, oh, I don't know how to do this. And then, yeah. And then I knew that. At that point, I'm like, well, if I can't even do this basic stuff he's shown at the start of the class, I need to come back every day and keep doing it and keep doing it mm -hmm. until I can get it. And then what else? Who else did I train with? I trained with Andre in his Tuesday night wrestling. That was really good. I really enjoyed that one. It was a lot faster paced than what I was used to than mm -hmm. other wrestling. He just, you know, he makes you drill a lot. He makes you do a really long warm up as well. It was really good. Ooh. And he's um, he's not like a huge guy as well, but I, mm -hmm. he just has a lot of energy. 
Andre, yeah, yeah, <laughs> he's uh, yeah, he's he knows he knows how to move someone's body really well. He's just yeah. one of those guys who's done it his whole life since he was however old he was, three mm. or four, and he's just he. Wrestling. It doesn't matter if you're hundred kilos or like. 50 kilos he can he can pick you up it's the, yeah. the, con, the movement controlling the movement of your body and the yeah. opponent's body that's yeah he's a master of um i guess mechanics and how to how to move someone's body in wrestling as well yeah he's really good at it and then what else i did uh i remember my first pad session with eugene as well i um yeah what did what did we do we we were going through jabs and feints and stuff and it was just like it was deer in the headlights it was all brand new to me all this stuff and like changing my stance just shifting my feet to be a little bit wider a mm. little bit closer and stuff like very technical stuff yeah the old um the my the previous style of striking that i learned it was good but it was very um it was very like ernesto Hoost style like we finished a lot with low kicks and um the boxing was um the boxing was good it was it was good for what i needed it was solid fundamentals and stuff but it just wasn't it just didn't have the depth and the layers that it does here so mm. it was um obviously i'm still like haven't even scratched the surface like still definitely learning the system of striking here but pretty much everything had to rechange hand positioning head positioning how my how i was standing and all that stuff so it was it was so much so much i had to take on board straight away yeah but i i think that's you know as much as the um or would you say the the kind of style that you were learning was like what we talked about just now, like you know, um, the style of like getting taking taking hits, you know, being inside, you know, not out of range, moving like in and out of range, you know, like the the style that you'd have to take a few. Oh yeah, yeah, I've, <laughs> yeah. I've taken some hits in some of my fights. Yeah, definitely. Even though like I'm quite long and quite tall, like uh, I hadn't um, learned how to use my range yet. I still don't know how to use my range quite as well as I need to, but like, yeah, I definitely hadn't learned how to utilize my full range. Yeah, I think in your uh, recent fight, um, was it last last weekend? Um, yeah, I actually noticed that you were using a lot of your 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 reach, you mm -hmm. know, and th it's that's exactly what um, you know someone who who has the height like yourself and that reach you need to make use of what you have. Mm. You know, and uh, yeah, I was watching the fight. That was, that was a really good performance, bro. And uh, I really enjoyed watching your fight. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it was on a stream. Someone was uh, streaming the thing on. <laughs> I know, I know who did it. I know who did it. Yeah, Someone, yeah. I'm not gonna say good names, on him. But, uh, good yeah, on him. Yeah. yeah. So they, you know, they were putting uh, bringing martial arts they, to the masses. Yeah, they were they were putting uh, you know, I think it was on a laptop, and then there was a phone there. So I was watching it from there. I tried to fight links, but I I, I couldn't find anything. And I couldn't make the event, so I was just watching through that. But that was awesome performance, bro. And I, I really enjoyed it. And um, I think you really, um, you know, you really utilize like your advantages in that fight. And like um, one of the things was like, you know, getting. I think I heard they're saying uh, trying avoid getting into like a a jujitsu kind of style mm. because they. I think they knew that you had a a very rich background in that. So. But yeah, and then um, you know, just to watch how when you got control and you went over him, and pretty much you could see that the fight was over, you know. And I was like, "Yo." There was one point in the first round where I did get clipped um, with a yeah, right I saw, hand. I saw I did, that one. I did I... the stanky leg. Um, <laughs> it was because when I got hit, I was kind of like in my head. I was like, "Oh." Um, I had drifted too far into his right hand and mm. I've gone over the breakdown with uh, Eugene as well. And it's, um, it kind of like, I felt comfortable in there, but it's still like the system is still quite, it's not, uh, it's not reactive yet. It's have to think about, mm. have to think about a lot of stuff before I go. It's got to become a natural thing. Yeah. Like it's you, not natural you don't yet. Have yeah. to think about it. And I feel like I'm also relying a lot on the corner, the advice from the corner. Mm. Like um, was it Kevin? Kevin was shouting at the corner. Or? Mark was Mark <laughs> Timms was yeah. shouting at the standout. Very good coaching from the corner from Mark mm. Timms as well. But um, once he got to the ground, I think Kevin took over. He, yeah. he yelled something in French. I didn't understand it. Well, why is he nah, yelling in French? <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to reach through the cage as well. The yeah. referee told him to back off. Oh, true, really? true story. Yeah. Oh shit! It was like up and against the cage. The ref's <laughs> like, just back off a little bit. <laughs> yeah. That's a bit of a distraction. <laughs> 
no, nah, but I did feel very yeah. comfortable in there. But as I said, like it wasn't quite natural. So a lot of the adjustments that were made were because of the, the coaching from Mark in the corner mm. in the stand up. Yeah. Nice. But it's, eventually I should get, I, I hope to get to the point where I can um, do that myself, where I can make the adjustments myself. Mm. The news that was like uh, Mike Perry had his girlfriend cornering him at the UFC event. Like, I don't know if you saw that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, I was watching that fight, bro. And I was like, yo, thank goodness that he was, you know, he put on like a good performance, but. That's um. That's I think that's the difference between kind of like a, a fighter or a brawler and yeah. uh, and a martial artist is because like, <laughs> he just relies on toughness and his ability mm. to knock people out. He's like, I don't need a corner. I can just go in there and knock him out. Like, well, he did. He like yeah. he won the fight. He won the fight. Yeah. But he only he at what cost though? Like mm. he got hit a lot. Like yeah, his, he his, did. His face was still pretty messed up. So you know. Yeah, that was that was such a weird like I, I don't know. I mean. I would like if you ask me, I wouldn't you wouldn't go in a fight with someone who doesn't have the knowledge in your corner to like as what you were saying, you know, you want to have the right people there to sort of yell out or give you instructions or just to see things that you can't see yourself. Yeah. You know, it's always different when you're right in front of the person and you're standing like a few meters away watching the whole thing. And you'll start you'll see a lot more and you'll pick up a lot more things. And uh so uh, bro, it's dangerous, and I think that was a very yeah, it's a big risk to take for him. But yeah, um, bro. I also think it comes down to a financial thing for him because mm. straight away on the mic afterwards, he was talking about tax problems. And yeah, I think he's 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 been to a few camps. He's been around a, a few camps, and I think um, he kind of got sick of just trainers and camps taking percentages from mm. his purse and stuff, and. If you if you follow Mike Perry on Instagram, you know he uh, he likes to spend money. He's definitely not on a budget. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't live on a budget. So having his girlfriend in number one, he saves money, and I think number two, he got he kind of got sick of like all these different coaches. Yeah, I think uh, with his personality as well, he kind of struggles a little bit to take. Uh, you can see that he struggles yeah. a little bit oh, to take yeah. instructions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a, he's well ADHD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty insane. Um. So yeah, pretty much, uh, you know, what has been your uh, out of training at, um, you know, out of training at City Kickboxing, what has been your experience like um, living in Auckland and uh, just the whole life here? Uh, when I first got here, I felt like, um, I felt like I'd kind of gone back in time a little bit. Like the first thing I noticed was not everywhere has pay wave. Yeah, <laughs> not everywhere has pay wave. Yeah, back then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the whole pay wave kind of moved. I think it kind of picked up. Oh yeah, definitely picked up over the pandemic for sure. Yeah, yeah. this yeah. year, or yeah. late last year, I think it. You know, uh, even like all the dairies and all that yeah. started to go into having. Yeah, my local bakery got pay wave, and now that I'm there like every day, <laughs> <laughs> which might not be a good thing, but yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, and um. So I, the first thing I noticed was like, it's a little bit back in time, but there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. And it's a lot slower here. Like the population of Auckland is a lot smaller than Sydney. The city's a lot smaller as well. So I actually quite enjoyed that. Like a, a city that's smaller and slower. Uh, I think a lot is, of people are going to disagree with you on that statement there. <laughs> well, compared Sm to Sydney. As... <laughs> compared to Sydney. Yeah, Let's, compared to yeah. Sydney. Yeah, we should, we should put that there. I really, I really liked Auckland because... Um, it's so good for someone who just wants to train. Like you, I just train, I go home, like I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. If I want to go to the beach, I can just jump in my car, drive 20 minutes, I'm guaranteed a parking spot. It's not going to be packed out at the beach. I can, you know, there's there's barely any lines for anything. Like even though I live in the middle of the city, um, it's, it's, still, it's still quite quiet, quite nice. It's very stress-free. Mm -hmm. people will say there's a lot of traffic and stuff but luckily i just live down the road from the gym so i don't have to, <laughs> yeah, I don't have to sit walk, in the traffic yeah a five minute walk to the, yeah. the gym yeah that's pretty sweet setup and uh talking about like uh a rent and stuff like that it's would it would you say it's pretty uh here in sydney uh similar similar mm. um in the city it's similar to sydney but if you go outside of um outside of auckland city and mm. you go a little bit west or a little bit east it's way cheaper than Sydney. Yeah. Yeah. Sydney will bleed you dry. 
But that's the thing, you know, in Sydney, obviously, the money that you, would you say the money that you earn will be higher compared to like working in New Zealand? And um, Yeah, definitely. So you kind of can support, yeah. you know, having higher rents and stuff like that mm. compared to like, um, you know, over here, wages a little bit lower. So, you know, and if you, I mean, where city kickboxing is, it's sort of in the city, you know, so rent's not really... Rent's not really uh, cheap over here, mm. um, but yeah, I mean, you, it's it's. I think it's a it's an awesome way to do it to live close to the gym, and it just gives you less excuses not to come to the gym to train. Yeah, yeah, for hundred percent. That's what I think about every time. It's like some days you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to the gym today. It's like I live five minutes <laughs> from the gym. You don't have a valid excuse now. There's guys who will sit in traffic for an hour to get to the gym and there's people who will travel from two hours north they get up at 4 a.m they're in their car at 5 a.m to make it to the gym on time i'm like don't no be, excuses don't be a bitch like yeah. get to the gym no excuses yeah. um okay throughout your one thing i wanted to ask like throughout your whole uh nine fights nine yeah what has been the best fight or best moment in your professional mma fight so far the best moment in my professional MMA fight career so far. So it was the end of 2017, probably probably October or November, like around this time now. And I had a, I had a start of that year, I lost a fight quite close. I thought I won, but eh, it is what it is. Mm. And then I had another fight in Townsville and I won that. And then I was going to fight this guy in Sydney in my backyard at a big top in Luna Park. So if you've ever been to Luna Park, there's like a big uh there's like a big concert hall there and they have some fight shows there, they have concerts there, they have like all this other stuff there. And so there's my myself and a few other people from Sydney who are on the card and they like bring in all these interstate guys, a few mm. few guys from New Zealand maybe, I can't remember, but I think I was the co main event and um I sold Heaps of tickets. I got all my friends and family there. Heaps and heaps of people. Like they packed the place out. Um, wow. There's a lot of hype going in. This guy's coming over from another state as well. So he's kind of like, you know, I'm easily the crowd favorite. Hmm. And I actually had a really good training camp for that one. Nice. Like um, I would get about three or four guys to sparring each week. Um, Put them up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like everyone everyone was on point for this one like i was getting my licks inspiring um conditioning was really good like i actually this is the first time that i did like a 12-week training camp or something wow. so i had um because this was also the first time that i didn't i wasn't at university mm. so i had all this time to train i had i was just working in the morning and i had the whole day to train so i had heaps heaps of training behind me it felt really good and um cut the weight all, all good weight came off real easy and then we get into the fight. I'm like, all right, this is it. Like all these guys, this guy who I was fighting, his name's Dan. All of Dan's fights had gone uh, three rounds and he was a wrestler and he pushes everyone up against the fence, which was, which at the time was kind of like my kryptonite getting push, pushed up against mm. the fence. So I was like, <clears throat> excuse me, at the, so I was like, okay, this is going to go three rounds in my head. I'm like, the whole training camp, I'm like, I'm getting ready for three rounds. I'm going to mm. push hard in conditioning. I'm going to make sure my body's really fit. And then um, we get out there. Uh, we have like a really, really intense stare down. <laughs> he's getting booed by the crowd when he's walking out. Really? I actually walked out first. He walked out second. Yeah. And he got booed by the crowd when he was walking out. Oh, man. And then, uh, yeah, we touched gloves, whatever. Mm. We bit of measuring back and forth. He shoots on me in like the first 20 seconds. Um, he takes me down. I managed to like hit a hit, hit a switch. So if you ever seen um, if you ever seen any wrestling or jiu-jitsu, like if you hit a switch, it's like a move to help you get back up and get to their back. Mm. Anyways, we get up as we're getting up. I pull his head into a knee and I just knock him out cold Ooh. with a knee in like thirty seconds. And I'm like, oh my god, wow. I just knocked this guy out in like yeah. thirty seconds. And then a bit of salt and pepper on top just to make sure <laughs> just to make sure he's done. And then, um, uh, yeah, and that was awesome because I had all my friends and family there, beat this guy in like 30 seconds, had an wow. awesome training camp. I was like, yeah, this is one of the highest highs that I've had. Wow, that, yeah. that was a pretty cool highlight. Bro. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was, um, oh yeah, it felt really good. And then the next fight after that, I lost. So yeah. <laughs> yin and yang, yeah. it's got to balance itself out. Yeah. 
Oh, hey man. you, don't forget to subscribe, like and share this video. I feel like there's a lot of pressure when you have like people who know you well, you know, like your friends, family and all that coming and they're all watching and like at the back of your mind, it's like, I don't want, you know, you don't want to get knocked out mm. or, you know, mm. you at least want to put on a, um, you know, even if it's, if it's not the best performance, you want to last the whole fight. You want to let them know that like they didn't waste their time and their money. <laughs> yeah, as, exactly. as like as cold as it sounds to the fighters mm. and stuff, it's like you want to make sure that these people who come to support you are here mm. to support you for a reason. Like they've taken their Friday or Saturday night off. They've spent, some people buy tables, they spend like $150, $200. Some people buy GAs, which in Sydney, it's not cheap. Like it's 80 bucks to go and see a show yeah, in Sydney. Was pretty, I was going to say, it's, the GAs there is pretty expensive. Yeah, it's quite expensive to go and watch. So you want to make sure that like at the end of the day, it's entertainment. Like they're going to be entertained. Even if you lose, you want to make sure that it's like, hey, you came to support me, but look, I tried my best. Put on like, a performance. Yeah, to put on a performance for you, yeah. Okay, so we're now at the challenge of this little challenge that uh, David Neath um, actually started, or well, Junior started, he carried on. But uh, wise words from the wise men. So would you have any words for uh, people listening, watching? Uh, if you're a fighter and you're watching this, one thing I could say to you is that it doesn't matter if you win, you draw, or you lose. Um at the end of the day, there's always going to be something bigger than the fight that, that you've either won, lost, or drawn. Mm -hmm. So it's not always the end of the world when you lose. And I I guess I had to learn this firsthand the hard way when I lost. I thought, you know, it's the end of the world. I lost. I lost quite badly as well in front of a lot of friends and family. And, yeah, it's just give it a week and everyone forgets about it. Everyone gets on with their lives. Like even a, some people, you know, the next morning they're like, Oh yeah, Cam lost. No. I'm gonna. What am I having for breakfast? Or well, they're like, yeah. Where am I going for to get drinks after this fight? Yeah. So there's always gonna be something, I guess, bigger going on. Um, you know, it's it's a it is a hard sport, but it is still a sport. Like people forget, even if you win, people still forget that a week later. Oh yeah, Cam won. Yeah. What am I gonna have for breakfast? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they don't care and. Well, they do care, but it's like, it's only a small aspect of their life. It's yes. a big aspect in your life, but it's only a small aspect. Yeah, they kind of put like life. very little importance in it. Maybe like a bit, yeah. but you know. Yeah. Like even, even like your coaches and stuff, even if you win like your coaches, the next morning they're like, oh, I got to get up and coach like a 7 a.m. class or whatever. I got to coach a 8 a.m. class. Like it's not, you're not going to be weighing on their mind like the whole time. Yeah, and I'd say another thing as well, which I learned uh, quite recently after watching Jan Blahovic fight, was that just keep going, don't quit. Like mm. he he's been fighting, I think, since he was twenty four, or well, professionally since he was twenty four. I think he was fighting as an amateur since he was sixteen, and he's thirty seven, and he just won the belt. That's, that's what that's crazy. Twenty one years of fighting, and he finally wins the belt. It can happen. You just have to keep going, keep making adjustments. So for any young fighters out there, there's always something bigger and never quit. Mm. That was a pretty impressive performance from him as well. That lick kick to Reyes body yeah. and like the mm. like you could see that mark straight after. It was like, Yo. Yeah. Yeah. I've when I saw when I when I was kinda I put a bet on Jan to win by knockout. I'm like, he's gonna knock him out. He's been fight he's had Way more fights than Dominic Reyes. Dominic Reyes is what, like, I don't, I don't know what his record is, but he, Jan Blahovic was fighting professionally before Dominic Reyes was even born. Like, that's, he grew up in Poland as well. Poland's a bloody tough place to live. It's cold. There's some tough people over there to train with. Like, look at Joanna as well. She's, like, mm. she's absolutely murked the chicks that she was fighting when she first started. Like, you got to take into account all those things. People are like, oh, Dominic Reyes almost beat John Jones. Like, that's great, but Jan hasn't fought John Jones, so we don't know how that would have gone. MMA maths is bullshit as well. Like, mm. don't worry about that stuff. And so it's people just completely just overlook the fact that he's had all these fights. He's way older. He grew up in a tough as hell place and that he hasn't fought John Jones. And people are like, Dominic Reyes is the man. He almost beat John Jones. I'm like, no, it's just because he's athletic. Like, I don't mm. think he's actually good as a fighter. 
martial arts wise. Yeah. Since we're on the topic of the um, the UFC two fight three, what were your thoughts on the uh, the fights of the boys? The boys, the boys did really well. I thought um, I thought it was it was a great showing for the gym. Um, pretty much flawless from Israel. What he got, he copped like two body kicks or something. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I really liked um, watching Brad's fight because all the training that he did, you could see uh, reflected in his in um, his fight. In his fight, his whole his whole mentality of like don't accept anything carried over into that fight. Like he got taken down, but he was getting back up. He didn't accept getting taken down. And then eventually that wears down on your opponent, his opponent, like um, his opponent uh, gassed out and I guess kind of mentally broke, especially when he got hit with that hook in the eye. Mm. He was, he knows, that guy knows it wasn't an eye poke. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, and you could you could see clearly as well. And uh, yeah, I heard, it was kind of funny. I heard and Eugene, Eugene going Eugene over in the corner. Oh, that was not a, <laughs> that was a punch. <laughs> and then you could hear Paul Felder go, oh, the city kickboxing but, corner getting quite angry. Yeah, yeah but free. I was, when I was like at home and watching it, I was shouting at, at, uh, at my TV as well. I was like, what the hell? That wasn't a eye poke and you're giving this guy time to rest. Yeah. Like I felt like if that would have went on, like Brett could have got a knockout, you know, mm. or a, a technical knockout at least. I was like, man. But anyway, the um, I think he, you know, you can't blame the guy, you know, and he, human error, it does happen. And um, unfortunately, Kai's fight as well. I've watched that guy. I watched him fight Tim Elliott. Yeah. When he beat Tim Elliott, and I thought, like, that people that are like, oh, that was a lucky man. spinning elbow. I'm like, are you kidding me? This guy, like, throws spinning elbows in his sleep. Like, this is what that he does. Like, cracker, he's, yeah, that was a crazy fight. Like, he's going to be awesome. a tough fight for anyone. Anyone who fights in the flyweight division. So it was. <laughs> It was, yeah, don't blink, for yeah. sure. Bro, there was so much. I, and I, I think I was talking to this with uh, Aroha as well. There was just so much action and it was going too fast. But I was like, okay, slow down, man. <laughs> <laughs> slow down. <laughs> Put it on 75% speed. Yo, it yeah. was like, boom, 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 boom. And you just, you just had to keep up, bro. Mm. It's crazy. And Shane's fight, like the whole thing with the weight cutting, I, I 100% agree with that. Mm. Um, four pounds. What was the guy? Like 159? That's That's like you might as well go up to welterweight. Like mm. four pounds could be one or two days worth of weight cutting. So imagine if Shane had, had to just wait in like two days before and got to rehydrate two days before as well. It could be a completely different story. Like yeah, it's weight cutting takes quite a bit from you yeah. as well. Especially if it's, um, if it's the, the last one or two days as well where you're really drained or even that last day where you just got to push in the bath like if you don't have to do that, I feel like you your performance is completely different. Yeah, you feel much yeah. better. You people say people will say like, or like especially the media when I say people, oh four pounds is nothing. I'm like, go you go in the sauna and do four pounds after you've already peed out like fifteen pounds and yeah. just like stripped your body. It's a everything. lot of weight. Yeah, you know, it's a lot of weight to lose, especially at lightweight when yeah. you already have very little weight. Yeah to lose and then you're just trying to squeeze you know from here and yeah. there and whatever and it's, it's like yeah. trying to wring out a dry towel trying to get moisture out of a dry towel it just doesn't it's it's hard yeah. Man. and yeah I think like uh, you know I heard a, a podcast Eugene was doing about you know he was he was pissed about you know this the guy not making the weight and um, I completely I completely understand you know like it doesn't matter um, who which gym the fighter is from or whatever but like what pisses me off is when you agree to a fight at a certain weight, mm. that is the first that is the first part of the first uh, thing that you have to deliver is getting there at that weight. Mm. And if you can't like, you know, unpopular opinion, but if you can't get that weight, then you shouldn't fight. Mm. That's what I think. Like, yeah, I you, agree. Because you already agreed on it. Like, it's like, you know... It's in the contract. Like you get paid to fight it this way. You don't get paid to fight at 159 pounds or yeah. 160 pounds. Like and you know, yeah. what if someone can come come in like, you know, 10 pounds heavier or whatever and just accept a 30% cut in, you know, and obviously, you know, he, he wouldn't have made it that much. Maybe he didn't have like a big enough um, payout to worry about at 30%, you know. Mm. Like maybe he's earning like this. The other, you know, arguments like you obviously making money outside of the UFC as well. Exactly. Endorsements, sponsorships, mm. this, that, whatnot. And that could have been just like a small, you know, cut 
We yeah, don't care. Exactly. Yes, that you know that sucks, bro, and it was a bit disappointing. But you know, I was I was really happy to um, see Shane get back in there and do it. And um, he, one of the things that yeah, Aroha was saying, like you know, the stuff that he bounced back from coming into the fight that was massive. You know, most people would have. Yeah, most people would have hung it up. Some. Yeah, li- like living with um, Shane and watching him train, it was like. Because I, oh, actually, I saw him at the start you, of the you camp lived with when him? we were living oh. um, in the lockdown. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I saw him at the start of the camp and then I saw him at the end of the camp and it was just like day and night. It was crazy, the transformation he made in like, I didn't even think he did a full eight weeks. He must have done like seven weeks or something. But it was crazy the transformation he made in that time. I'm like, man, if he keeps going after this fight mm. and he keeps training and he puts in like, he just keeps going the way he was, it's going to be. He could be world champion by the you know in a few years time or whatever. Like it's he could be fighting top fifteen, top ten, top five guys. Like it's insane how quickly his his body and his mind adapts to get ready for a fight in mm. that short period of time. That's pretty impressive. And like um, I didn't know the full story, but um, there was a last minute replacement as well. Mm. The guy that he fought, um, the other guy pulled out. What do you know? What the reason was? Or? I think he got COVID. Oh shit! Yeah, positive COVID, t- positive test, and I got think pulled that's out. what happened. Yeah. Oh shit, that's not good. <laughs> but I think yeah, that, that's that's quite hard as well. Like you know, you have this, you know, um, things that are out of your control. You know, one week out from the fight, positive, can't fight, so replacement and Southpaw as well. Yeah, a All different different Southpaw. style. Yeah. You know, and like it's a bit it's a bit difficult. But you know, you you've gone too far in, and obviously, you know, this is your livelihood. If you don't fight, you don't get you don't get paid, mm. and you you know you you're that far and you you got to do it you know and uh, I don't know it's like I feel like it's quite hard you know to get that last minute you know adaptation to this new fighter. It's not an easy task, man. No. And uh, for him to have still mm. gone to take the fight with this guy, and then this guy not making weight to still go and fight this guy. Bro, that's in itself. That's a win. I, I see that as a win already, bro. What are your uh, yeah? What are your plans from here, Ken? Before oh, we go, uh, plans from here. I want to try and squeeze in one more before the end of the year. Ooh. But who knows? We have an election coming up. <laughs> if depending on who stays in power, will might also determine how how lockdown goes ahead. Mm. If there's a if there's another spike in cases, but I don't think it will. I did I, you know the borders are actually not really open yet, but like uh, now they've they've allowed. Uh, they've okay. They've put in a system in place to allow tourists to come in. So basically, uh, what it is is you'd have to apply, uh, set up an account, and apply for a uh, a space in quarantine. And basically, you got to pay. Um, I think it's uh, thirty one hundred uh, per adult. And so you got to apply for that space in quarantine. And if you get it, if it's approved, um, then you can go on and book your tickets and come in. So it is actually technically it is open like. But mm. with you know restraints, so you have to do your two weeks in quarantine. Which you know, I, I don't know what uh, you know in terms of like getting ready for a fight might not be the best option to spend two weeks in quarantine just before your fight. No, no. So way. you'd have to come out like way earlier. But it is there, mm. so you know. I think it'll have to be a domestic fight for sure. Mm. Yeah, there's a, there's a few middleweights and light heavyweights um, around. In the South Island and in the North Island as well, that um I've got my eye on. Um, I just need a show, mm. I just need a show to uh to fight them on. But hopefully one more before the end of the year. I have a combat jujitsu uh, match coming up. Uh, was November seventh on um, Mana Championship. So that that'll be fun. That'll keep me busy as well. But um next year, if the pandemic is over try and get about three or four fights and that would be good oh wow yeah. so one fight at least every three months yeah yep. yeah i think that's a good um kind of schedule to have that's yep. like not too many or not too little try to get that any, uh, any names bro? any names any you names <laughs> any names on who you'd like to face well i had um a guy in australia who runs a show uh and he we're, we're trying to get some former ufc fighters who used to be in the ufc mm. try and try and get one of them to fight yeah uh, oh nice yeah I'm not too sure how that's going to go with the whole pandemic but we'll see yeah yeah. hopefully work something out mm. um, and uh, obviously what do you say the main goal would be to compete in uh, which organization 
the main goal is going to be to get into the UFC, join the, join the rest of the boys there. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And um, hopefully we'll do a five peat one day or a six peat or a seven peat. However many we got on there, yeah. we'll get on the card. I th- like uh, that's what's what's awesome is um, I think with especially the uh, recent event that they have on, you know, people starting to. Well, City Kickboxing was the best, you know, it was voted the best or ranked the best MMA gym in the world last year, mm. you know. So it was already people are starting to take notice. And I think a lot more fighters are going to come out from here, like yourself, you know, Kevin, Bloods, mm. Carlos. So a lot more fighters coming up. And I wouldn't be surprised if you you had an event was like I mean, 90% of the fighters, yeah. <laughs> you know, from... New Zealand, Australia, you know, UFC, kind of Auckland, the whole red corner, just city kickboxing. <laughs> just everyone from city kickboxing. Yeah. Oh, that'd be awesome, man. Yeah. I look forward to that day, no, bro. I dope. look forward to that day. Um, but yeah, anyway, Cam, thank you very much for uh, coming on the podcast today. You. Appreciate your time. Me. And um, oh, uh, shout out. You want to shout out to your sponsors as well? Shout out to <laughs> Labyrinth Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. And uh, we don't have any products yet, but Budo CBD, you can follow them on Instagram. Ooh, see, getting into the CBD stuff. You, how, how's good it been stuff. for you, bro? So I, I tried another CBD yeah. um, when we were in lockdown here. And it was, to be honest, I didn't even feel any different. Mm. And then I tried the Budo CBD uh, and I slept straight through the night. I usually get Shit. up like four or five times to pee during the night. Yeah. And I didn't get up once and I was busting so so Ooh. bad. Yeah. But it was it was a great sleep. Like I measure my HRV with mm. um with this whoop strap. Yeah. So it goes onto my phone. And usually during the week I'll be like mid range, not that good, like yellow zone, red zone. But I woke up and I was ninety nine percent yeah. Shit. In the green. That was like yeah. really good recovery. It was like awesome. all my sleep was in um How do we get that stuff? Budo, C- Budo, Budo C B D. You can follow Budo C B D on yeah. Instagram and um you can shoot them a message and they will, they don't have the website up and running just yet. But, yep. um, so it's like more yeah. direct messages now yeah. for the beginning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Awesome. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's really good. I feel, I did feel a big difference. Like usually my knees are quite sore from a lot of the training, but it was just like my joints felt really good Ooh. afterwards. Yeah. It's even so, better than like a glucosamine, chondritin and turmeric and all that. Yeah. Yeah, Ooh. that's all. Oh, definitely. <laughs> that's all rubbish. Come on, <laughs> you gotta have the CBD. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a you lot. I mean, that's, that's awesome as well. Like uh, a lot of people pushing um, CBD products and all that, and there's because there's so many there's you know so many benefits of it, and uh, you know people should make use of what there is out there. Mm. Um, yeah. So fuck. Anyway, um, thank you very much, Cam, for uh, coming. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the coffee as well. That was really good coffee, bro. Nice, good coffee supreme. Thank you for down having the me. road. Yeah. 23, 23 Cafe down the road in Ooh. Mount Eden. Yeah. Shout Pretty out to awesome, them. man. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for the good coffee, guys. And uh, Cam, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just want to wish you all the best in your uh, MMA journey. And I uh, hope to see you getting in the fights that you want. And uh, also, man, really looking forward to see you in the UFC pretty soon. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank brother. you, Ali. Cheers, man. Thank you, bro. All right. That's us. Thank you for watching this episode. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. And I'll see you on the next one.